Good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Real quick, before we begin, if there's any other ladies who'd like to join us with the women's choir this morning to sing for the fathers, you can make your way up here. We're singing it as well, so you just make your way up here. Um, if not, let's go ahead and all stand. We're going to sing hymn 453, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessed peace, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from. Direct your attention to the screen. Well, one of the churches that the Goldfish Victory VBS will be held is right here, First Baptist Church of Owenton, starting tomorrow. And please pray, this place is going to be filled with fun and excitement, and we're going to have the privilege of teaching our children about victory that we have in Jesus. And so pray for our workers, our Sunday school, uh, our BBS teachers, our, all of the leaders that are part of this week ahead uh, that will kick off at 9 a.m. tomorrow until noon, four years of age through the sixth grade. Uh, have your children here, have the grandchildren here, encourage them to bring a friend, and we are in for an exciting week. And uh, so please pray for us uh, for this week ahead. Uh, the commencement service will, the, uh, I guess the culmination of the Victory Week will be held at this time next Sunday. So be aware of that. Get the word out to your friends, their parents. Let's get them in the house of the Lord for that culmination Victory service uh, next Sunday. But be praying for us daily. Uh, as we will host this Vacation Bible School. We do have one need left Thursday and Friday. If you can help in the nursery, please let Lee Carroll know today. If you can help on those two days, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. All right. Well, we welcome you today. Uh, good to see you in the house of the Lord. Uh, we just pray today on this Father's Day that... Uh, you have had a moment to thank the Lord for your dad. Uh, if he's in heaven, just thank God for the influence that he's had on your life uh, on this special occasion. If he's, a, if he's living, make sure you let him know today that you love him and appreciate him and, uh, and commend him uh, for the man that he is and pray for him. Uh, on this special day. So we welcome you to the house of the Lord as we're celebrating the Heavenly Father, but we're also celebrating each earthly father uh, that is present today. So we welcome you. If you're visiting with us, please let us know by filling out one of the guest cards there uh, so we can pray for you. And if we can serve you in any way, uh, it would be our great privilege to do that. So we welcome you. We also want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. We I uh, have just returned from a week-long mission trip in Haiti. Uh, Twenty-two of us uh, had the joy of serving among our, our Haitian brothers and sisters and uh, with the Baptist Haiti mission, and it was a great week, uh, a learning experience, an opportunity to serve. And I want to tell you, your children who went 
The adults who went representing our church uh, did a fantastic job, worked hard. It was a different type of trip than the last two years, very labor intense. Uh, uh, we had our moments of learning flexibility and just getting home, we had to learn to be flexible uh, to get back after some delays and uh, misconnections and spent four hours in one of the finest hotels in Miami. Uh, but checking in at midnight and leaving at 4 a.m., we didn't really get the full effect of staying there. Uh, thank you, American Airlines, for that four hours of, of, uh, of time there. But anyway, thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. Without that, we could not have gone. Uh, do you realize that our church in budget and the special gift, you covered one-third of the cost of every individual that attended this mission trip. And without that, uh, some would not have been able to go and serve the way they did. So your rewards uh, are only known by the Father. Uh, and But thank you for your prayers and your giving. And uh, it's just good uh, to serve the Lord everywhere, Haiti, but now here at home. And uh, we certainly welcome you today. We're going to have a word of prayer this morning. And we want to remember some special uh, matters. Uh, let's continue to pray for the Virgil Cobb family uh, as they are dealing with the home going of a dad, granddad, and uh, just great granddad. Maybe is it great great granddad? Was he great great? How many greats? I know he was had to be. He was a great one. Huh? All right. Gonna, was going to turn 100 years old, just a matter of weeks. Uh, our oldest was July the 5th. Our, our oldest was our oldest living uh, church member. You know, we're celebrating 150 years here in July. And Mr. Virgil was uh, involved or in this community for 100 of those years. That's something just to kind of sink in. Uh, it's amazing. But... Uh, Anyway, pray for their family. Uh, also, Debbie McMillan, uh, we received word while in Haiti. She had uh, had, had a stroke. Uh, she is doing much better in a regular room now, beginning to walk some. The words are gradually coming back more and more. Just pray for Debbie that that will continue to be the case. Uh, Rusty's brother, Howard, had a, a scare uh, last night, a mild heart attack there. They had to do two stints. and. So pray for him today. Continue to pray for David Bowling as he's recuperating from recent surgeries. Uh, pray for our Vacation Bible School uh, that the Lord would honor and bless uh, that week. And uh, let's remember to pray for one another. Uh, but let's do that right now. Let's pause and, and lift these knees before the Lord. Father, we, we just want to right now thank you for the privilege it is to be a child of God and to know you personally and to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the answered prayers for our mission team. Thank you for the great work that was accomplished. Thank you for your watch care over us and uh, during that week. We pray, Father, for the Baptist Haiti mission today that you will bless their leadership, uh, bless those, those interns and the workers uh, with the Mountain Ministries, but also especially those who who served us this past week, and as they are starting a new week now, it's all starting over for them. Lord, renew their strength. Give them joy. Help them, Lord, not to lose their delight in the midst of their constant duty. Bless them as they are serving another team uh, this week and, and be with the work there. And we pray for the counts that are coming up in a matter of weeks, the hundreds and hundreds of Haitian children that will be served on that count, that, Lord, many would, would come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we thank you for the small part we were able to play in that. Father, we do want to pray for Debbie today and pray for continued healing within her body. May her ability to move and walk, the words will become more free and that you will restore her and just raise her up and may this be to the glory of your name. Bless her today. We pray for 
Virgil Cobb family, that you will give great comfort to them in the midst of their sorrow. We pray for Howard today for continued good reports and healing in his body. We pray for David Bowling, that you'll bless him, Bill McGibney. We pray, Father, for our VBS team. We pray for every child that will be a part of this in this week ahead, that as we instill the Word of God in their heart, Lord, as we use this time of investing in their lives, we pray it would be the next step in that progression and that understanding and that coming to realization of their need of a Savior. We just pray that you would bless the effort and the work that will be carried out here in the week ahead. Father, we ask for your mercies to be upon us as we worship together now. Bless our time in worship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand once again. Join us in singing Faith of Our Fathers. Faith of Our Fathers
While the ladies are sitting down, I want to say a quick word uh, to the church body. Uh, ben, before he does our scripture and prayer, and Chuck, come on up here a minute. Uh, I want I want to just commend uh, both of these two men here. Uh, we are a blessed church to have these two men on our staff. And as we were serving in Haiti, I just had the joy of stepping back and watching them in action. Uh, you should have seen the looks on the face of the Haitians, especially the interpreter, the first night they're gonna teach us a song, and our group pretty much knows it. And I look over there and Chuck is just like singing perfectly in Creole and just worshiping the Lord. And I thought, man, he can, he can lead worship here at one of the, one of the churches. And I, I just sat back and I can't help but just say I was, I was kind of let pride say, yeah, that's one of ours. And, uh, and just was thankful that the Lord has put Chuck in our midst as our worship leader. And then I watched this young man as our youth pastor demonstrate leadership skills beyond his age and depth of knowledge in scripture and insight and discernment of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, I just, this trip as your pastor confirmed in me that the Lord has led us in these two men serving among us. And you just need to thank God for that. And uh, we saw it firsthand, especially the adults who were with me watching this. So I just wanted to commend both of these staff members. Job well done. You did a good job, and we commend you for it, and thank the Lord for you uh, in the service you're giving to him. Amen. God bless you. Now you can leave us in Like Brad said, we had a great time in Haiti. Uh, had a lot of work to do, but we did it uh, with uh, joyful hearts and uh, good spirits about it. But today we're going to be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Um, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. while well, he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them, and in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you, in the wa come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. But Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will
What this dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and work without applause. A man who raises a shield of faith protecting what is pure, whose love is tough and gentle. A man whose word is sure God doesn't need an orator who knows just what to say. He doesn't need authority to reason him away. He doesn't need an army to guarantee a win. He just needs a few good men. 
walls of broken derelict who life has been renewed he calls the one who has the strength to stand up for the truth enlistment lines are open and he wants you to come in he just needs a Six, I realize today is a day that we honor our fathers, whether your father is living or has gone on to glory, uh, we still seek to honor them. Uh, they've gone on to glory, we seek to carry on their faith and the examples that they set before us. If your father's living, pray for him. He's not a perfect man, pray for him. Pray that God would make him, help him to continue to be the man that the Lord would desire. This morning in our text, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, we're dealing with Paul writing to Timothy. And he reminds Timothy of who he is. That is, he says, you're a man of God. He starts out by saying, but you, Timothy, O man of God. And I want every man here this morning, whether your dad or not, realize that your greatest desire and goal in life should be that of being a man of God. How do you become a man of God? The first step is, is by knowing the God-man, Jesus. You receive Him. You trust in Him. And once you receive Him as your Lord and Savior, he begins to work in you. One night, Ben was talking to us about being fishermen. And I noticed in my Bible a quote by Dr. Rogers, and uh, Brother Bob says he has a shirt with this theme on it. It just says, concerning being a fisherman, you catch them, and I'll clean them. God. <laughs> God does the cleaning. God does the work in us. Once we become a man of God, there are things that he works in us. There are some things he works in and we work out. And Paul is sharing with Timothy some things that a man of God ought to be working in and out. And this morning, dads, I'm going to challenge you to examine, are you letting God work these things in? Now, the scriptures, the application of scripture is for all of us. I'm speaking to dads. But you know what, mom? young person, young adult, th these scriptures will improve, encourage, and change your life as you apply the principles that he gives to this man of God. 
I love the fact that while we were in Haiti, I heard that term a lot among the Haitians. One night, young interpreter Jerry said, I want to talk to you about the Bible. So we sat down and we talked for a couple of hours. And it was interesting right off the bat. He said in his own way, I am a man of God. And what he was saying is, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I desire to exemplify who he is. And that's how the subject, that's how the conversation would often uh, begin, as they would use that term for themselves, I'm a man of God. And I hope that we will strive, men, to be men of God. Paul shows Timothy some areas that will guide him as a man of God. These areas will help us to be men of God. They will help us to be women of God. They will help you as a dad to be a better dad to be a dad that has an impact on the life of the children he has given to you, and your impact never ends. It doesn't matter how old your children are. You are having an impact in their life. The last night of our time on the mountains, we had a very special, memorable moment together as a team, and it was an opportunity that, uh, of encouragement to one another, but it went from an encouragement to one another to... to we were given letters from family members. And that night, it had been a very moving night, an encouraging night, a night of being reminded of how much we are loved by God, how much we are loved by our fellow believers, but it led to how much we are loved by our family. And I looked around the room at many of our young people with their heads on their table reading these letters from you, some of you moms, dads, Your children were sobbing as they read those letters of encouragement. As I opened my letters, I had this wonderful letter from my wife and my four children of things that they have seen in me to encourage me as a a dad and as a husband. And I found myself uh, finding the tears falling and realizing, you know, I've done a lot of things wrong but I give thanks to God for the things He's done through me that has had an impact for good. And realizing that even though they're older, I'm still carrying out a role in their life that they're looking and examining and learning from. And if that be the case, I better walk carefully. I better listen carefully what the Bible says about a man of God and what needs to be true because they're still watching me though they're making decisions now on their own as adults. And so today, fathers, listen to the Scripture and realize that if you'll walk according to these principles, it'll make you the man of God that has a good impact on the life of your family, the life of your children, no matter their age. The first thing that he says to Timothy as a man of God, he says, Timothy, if you're going to be a man of God that has an exemplary life, there are some things you need to flee from. You need to move away from. And he says to him, flee these things. Well, he doesn't list the things in this verse because he has already described them in the verses that precede. In verses 3 through 10, he has described for Timothy the dangers of becoming a lover of money. Many people have misquoted the Scripture by saying that money is the root of all evil, but we know that Paul says to us here that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He is saying that when we allow the pursuit of to become become an obsession, it leads to very dangerous things in life. And dads, if we are going to have an impact in the lives of our kids, we have to flee the things that he mentions there. The word flee means to separate yourself from, to literally move continually away from. It it never ends. You got to move away from that. That's danger. That's wicked. It has consequences that you don't want to experience. And when I was reading through this and squeezing in a little time here and there, preparing for this in in Haiti, Ben one night just kind of demonstrated what I had secretly had felt. 
as we would go to work and then in the afternoons had time to go out into the ocean area and swim and cool down and I I'd never I've never snorkeled but they had they had available the the snorkel I guess is that what you call it the snorkel snorkel see I'm really expert at that stuff and had the little mask that you put on where you can see and swim around and look and you know I'd been out in the ocean the year, first year and walking around and this year and so I decided well everybody says it's neat so I went out there and uh, you know you get to see the fish floating around and uh, swimming around and then we just went further out and further out and, and got a good ways out and you get out to a, a little area I guess the reefs is out in that area and it kind of protrudes up and and they had told us the first day you know be careful there's what's called sea urchins you know out there they they pick up as you go further out and, and what best way they're like either golf balls tennis balls baseball size porcupine balls you know they're just little prickly needles it just round I found out guys I looked it up that their delicacy in France and Japan they eat those things they crack them open and eat them and all those that y'all caught and threw away y'all could have made a lot of money on that stuff but anyway that was one of our jobs believe it or not uh, we would go out and they Ben and I think Ty and Ross and I don't know who else uh, went out and, and collected the sea urchins that were near the swim line so when the kids come they won't step on them and hurt themselves and collected hundreds of those things but as we swam out you get near the reef line and and I noticed they're everywhere you know and so I, I'm swimming around and and then I start seeing these things and you know there's a little sense of something happens when you see something that's a little scary and your breathing changes and I I kind of found myself Ooh, look at that one. Oh my goodness look at that one uh, I need to I need a place to pause a minute you know you're out in deep water and I'm thinking where am I, I can't stand anywhere I'm gonna step on one of those things and and so you're like I got to get out of here I got to flee away because they went from golf ball size to baseball size to football size and I'm thinking these things you know I've heard about them that if they sting you there's painful and, and so here you are you go from this you know breaststroke of swimming through the waters looking around to, to swimming like this to doing the dog paddle till you go into the mood and Ben, ben didn't realize that, that this is what I had felt and then what I did he said yeah you get out there and you sort of become a miniature dog you know you're like you know I mean that's what I was doing and I thought did he see me doing that because you know you're up there and you're like I got to get away from this but I don't want to hit anything so you're just trying to please get me out of here you know and you're not breathing well and you're about to choke on salty water and you're mask is filling up with water and you just know you're going to be attacked that's what this word is flee move away from run continually from those things what are the things flee from matters that are attached to the love of money the pursuit of it to the point that it becomes out of balance it becomes an obsession there are many things that can become an obsession with us that in the long run removes us from our family, from meaningful moments, from events. It doesn't mean, men, that there are times you're on call. You have to, duty demands that you have to, to be away from family. It's part of providing. What he's talking about here is when you get to the place in life that you, you look for opportunities to be separated. Money becomes the all obsession of life the bottom line how big the paycheck is and how much we have and how much we own we got we have to remember dad that providing things if we're not careful when it becomes an obsession replaces or substitutes being there we we get to thinking that all oh, that my value and worth is in what I provide no your value and worth is who you are it is your time with them it is being there it's not meeting every wishful want it is being present and he says flee these things that become an obsession because what happens is as we become obsessed with the love of money it then moves us into more dangerous things he says in those verses he says that leads us into it's the root of all kinds of evil from which some strayed they become greedy they pierce themselves through with many sorrows oftentimes an obsession with money then leads into a lifestyle of immorality 
I've always wondered why is that? Why is it that people that get obsessed with things and money, they seem to then drift into the immoral realm? And I believe what it is, is that there's still that driving need inside of that person to feel that need and they do it in perverse ways because it comes with no commitment. The person that they are being fulfilled by is just a, basically a, a tool. The dignity of that person has been attacked because we've distorted God's gift of intimacy and and, and we're meeting these needs in perverse ways and there's no commitment connected to it. Family requires commitment. Marriage requires commitment. But when we get obsessed with things and that becomes what defines us as men, we then want to find a way to fulfill this growing need within of intimacy, but we want to find it in a way that there's no commitment attached. That's why he says, be careful with obsession for the love of money because it leads to immorality. Tragically, it then leads to idolatry. The things become our God. They control us. We get obsessed with the love of money. It leads us into immorality, and then we find ourselves living a life of idolatry. And idolatry can be that those things that keep us from becoming great for God. Uh, they can become, they are normally often good things that rob us of doing the best things. And so if we are to be dads that have a continuing influence in the lives of our children, recognize there's things to flee. To be a man of God, to be a dad that leaves an eternal mark in the heart of your children, Flee these things. Move away from them as quick as you can. I'm talking, this isn't a time where you do the mini dog paddle. This is when you do the great stroke to get out of harm's way. You move away from it, and you never stop running continually from it. Because it will always be pursuing you, no matter your age. So flee these things. But then he says, pursue these things. He is saying, men, there are some things we remove from our lives and pursue uh, uh, to move away from, but then there are things that we are to fill our lives with. You know, we, we, we don't just take things away and leave a void, but we put things in the place of those evil pursuits, and he named those. He says, follow after, pursue after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Dads, if you want to have an everlasting, eternal impact on the lives of your children and family, recognize these few words represent how you can have that impact. First three words, righteousness, godliness, faith. Righteousness is a word that means having personal integrity. Godliness means having personal holiness or personal devotion. Faith that he uses is the word that means being faithful. Can I just use one phrase, men? What do you follow after? You desire to guide with your actions. You want your actions to demonstrate a life that has been changed by the Lord. And this encourages, it's something our children can emulate. They can learn from. They want to look at your example. One of my children wrote me a note and said, when I'm in a position of making a decision, many times I ask myself the question, what would dad do? Well, I was honored by that, but I was also fear, it caused fear in my heart because dad doesn't always do it right. And I have to be careful that I'm guiding with actions that are appropriate, that are, that, that are the right way and the godly way. So Dads, we must follow after these things so that our actions speak loudly to our children. Not only do we want to guide with our actions, we also want to grant unconditional love. Because the next word he uses is love. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, but then he says pursue love. The word love here is the agape word that means unconditional love, a God-like kind of love. As I was sharing with you on that final night of worship that Ben and Chuck had prepared and put together, when it was all over, my first thoughts and response was tonight. We have been reminded 
of the overflowing love that God has for us. But secondly, we have been reminded of the overflowing love that we have for one another. And then, in the very end, it reminded me of the overflowing love that our family has for us. You can't beat that. To know God loves you this much, to know your brothers and sisters in Christ love you this much, and to know your family, your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your children love you this much, there's nothing better than that. Dads, he is saying that we are to pursue after agape love. That means having an unconditional love for our children. Men, your, your children are going to fail you. Write it down. They're going to fail you. They're not going to meet your expectations at time. Realize it. Accept it. Sometimes it's good they don't meet your expectations because sometimes my expectation for my children was not God's expectation, God's plan. And I had to learn that and had to give God room to work and speak and lead their lives. Unconditional love means that I will love them when they don't meet my expectations and when they fail me, I will love them period. I will love them when they drift. I will love them when they stray. I will love them when they're out of the will of God. Dad, the greatest thing you can give your children is an unconditional kind of love. My wife had a great, great relationship with her dad. She loved her dad. He was a major figure in her life. I'll never forget when she told me this. When she went off to college, she took an art class and the teacher had them to just paint a picture of their family. So everybody, you know, painting and slopping things around. And Libby did her painting, paint, you know, mother, dad, siblings. And then the teacher said, let's just examine, you know, what y'all have done. And, you know, some looked at them and they said, it means this, this, this. And then they got to Libby's. Well, the teacher said, what does this mean? They said, oh, it means she has a mom and dad and four siblings. Our teacher said, no, you're missing the point. You're not seeing it. Look a little closer. Because when Libby painted her picture, there was her mother, very distinct figure. There was the siblings, but then her dad. I mean, it was like, you know, mom, siblings, dad, dad. He said, do you see it? Her dad has a major influence in her life. She honored her dad. She lived 500 miles away from her dad, but I tell you, she lived as though her dad was next door and when we dated we lived as though her dad was with us <laughs> we honored him I lived in fear and trembling I was more afraid of her dad than God I mean I'm just being honest with you <laughs> I knew God would forgive I didn't know about that <laughs> and it was her heart's desire to honor her father but as we were married, she came to that place to realize, I love my dad, I will honor my dad. But ultimately, my dad's life was that of honoring God. And my greatest call is to love God and honor Him more than my dad. That was a huge step for her. There was this unconditional love that she grew up with, and there was this impact that he had on her life. Dads, you can have that same impact on your children's lives. Love them unconditionally. And then last of all, guard with your words. Follow, he says, gentleness. The word gentleness means meekness. It means power under control. And I tell you, this is the one that I flub up many times. I have the power to say whatever I want to to my children. I can... I can I can push my authority. Sometimes, Dad, the worst thing we can do is speak without being under control. The power of the words. As a little child, we learned the song, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we know the reality, don't we? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will literally strip my soul out of me. Words will rip me apart and it will be with me the rest of my life because of something that my dad said. Even recently I said something to my youngest. 
that was out of place. He didn't meet my expectation on the matter. And I cut him. I took, took an arrow and shot it right through him. And it was the time that he knew, man, it was, I, I feel bad. And Dad comes along and just cuts a little deeper. And I had to go to my son and say, I'm sorry. I didn't control my word. I wasn't encouraging. I didn't guard my words. Dads, we can do damage to our children when we're not following after gentleness, power under control. Oh, God, help us control our tongue that we not speak out words. Yeah, they blew it. They made a mistake. They did something wrong. And they know it. But the worst thing we can do is come and pounce on them and say, boy, let me give you some more. I want you to feel it. We guard our words. In a fleeting moment, a word can lead to a lifetime of issues. Dads, follow after these things. And then he says in verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Dads, we've got to fight for our children. That word there means to agonize. It's agonia. It means fighting the battle on their behalf. How do we fight for them? Who are we fighting for them? You know, when we were in Haiti, one of the interpreters preached one night about the battle, the spiritual battle, the good and evil, the wickedness. And, you know, I thought, man, in Haiti, uh, you can pretty much identify it. You know, you're driving down the road, you know, an hour and a half, and you look up and you see these little shacks on the side of the hills and mountains, and you see these flags flying and waving, and you ask, what, what is that place? Oh, that's where the voodoo doctor lives. Oh, okay, that's so, oh, we, we identify it. That's bad. Don't go there. Don't go there. But we come home to America. We don't have the flags flying outside the homes. We're not as aware of where Mr. Voodoo Doctor lives. The battle is a spiritual battle, an invisible battle that is going on. And what do we do, Dads? We fight it. We fight the good fight of faith. We agonize through it. We realize that our children are going to face an enemy that they don't see with their eyes, but we're aware of, we're aware of the principalities and powers. And how do you fight for them? You pray for them. You pray for your children. You pray for them daily. You get into the Word, and when you come to Paul's prayers for the church, and Dad, I tell you, I want to encourage you, go to Ephesians 1 today and find the prayers of Paul, and when you get to those prayers, take out the you and the hour and us and we and you put your child's name there and you pray that prayer you pray a scriptural prayer for them but then pray with them they need to hear you calling their name out to God they need to hear you praying for them and, but praying with them and praying on their behalf and let me say dads pray, pray a blessing over them pray a blessing over them ask God to, to guide you as you pray over them that you might bestow upon them a blessing that they will be set free to be great for God and that you envision for them greatness in the sight of God not to become the next millionaire or the next successful businessman but envisioning for them that they're going to be great in the kingdom of God great in the hand of God that he has a purpose and plan for them and God's going to use them and you pray a blessing over them that's how you fight for your children you fight the good fight of faith and then last of all, Dad, be faithful to, faithful to what? The Word. He says to him, verse 14, keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. What does that mean? It means, Dad, you are faithful to what he just told us. You're faithful to the Word that you spend time in the precious Word of God and you yourself apply its principles to your life and they see a living book. They see the scriptures. They see the Bible in living colors. They watch it and behold it. You may have failed miserably, Dad. I want to tell you what. You've done more good than you'll ever realize. And the greatest good that you can do for your children is to love Jesus with all of your heart. Love His Word. 
Be quick to ask forgiveness. Humble yourself before them when you failed miserably. And that will have an impact on them. It would be branded in their brains all of their life to know, man, my dad, he wasn't perfect. He made some bad mistakes, but he loved Jesus. He loved the Word. He tried hard to apply the principles to his life. That's what will go with them all the days of their life. Dads, I want you to know you're doing a good job. The way we know it is, for most and many, we look at your kids. That night, Ben threw the pen to Cheyenne. And I was so proud of what he said to Cheyenne. He said, Cheyenne, you're doing an excellent job. You're a good dad. Here's how I know. Because I know your son. You're doing a good job, dads. How do I know? Because I've been watching your kids. I've been listening to your children. I've been watching how they walk. Be encouraged. Be encouraged that it's not too late to start. Be encouraged that there's opportunities to begin anew. Some of you have. And I heard some of your kids talking about it. I don't want to name names, but there's some dads in this room that your kids said things. They said, and it just made my heart well up with joy. They're watching. They're proud of you. They're glad that you are their dad. Follow hard after these things. And in your latter years, you will be a blessed man because of what you see in your children. And they will be blessed children because of what they saw in you. I want every dad to stand for a minute. Every dad stand. Dad, if you trusted Jesus, you're a man of God. That's who you are. It's not what you do in life that makes who you are. That's not who you are. Who you are, if you know Jesus, you're a man of God. A man of God, and you are having an eternal impact. You are. Know who you are, a man of God. Follow after these things. Flee after those things. Fight for the good, the good fight. Pursue hard to be faithful to the Word of God. God is using you. I want to pray over you now. A blessing of encouragement and wisdom that you continue to have the impact that you're having. If one of these men that are standing is your daddy, I want you to pray for him. If it's your husband, you pray for him. You pray that God would work these things in him and that he can work them out of him. Pray for him specifically, quietly to the Lord as I lead and pray for your dad. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for the simplicity of Scripture. You make it to where I can understand it. And that makes it simple. And Lord, I know that in these words we see very clearly what it is to be a dad that has a positive, lasting impact on their children. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, that we can look to, we never see failure in, and we learn from, and you gave us the instructions of who you are, how you work in this book. I pray for each one of these dads, Lord, that you will encourage them this morning. Encourage them. May they see the good. May they see the positive. May they see the steps in which they have had a good influence in the life of their children. And their children are benefiting from their positive walk with Jesus and they will be encouraged by that because Lord I know they've also faced discouragement they have faced moments that they have doubted themselves they have faced moments that they have felt they have been failures and that they have have created this direction or have added toward that child's decision to be where they are and Lord I pray that you will encourage them and remove that spirit of discouragement and that they can see that they can begin even now having a positive influence in the life of their children. Father, I pray for each one of us as dads that when you point out those areas where we have fallen and failed, 
that you'll give us a spirit of humility, a spirit in which we can go to our sons and daughters and plead with them and ask for them to forgive us, and that you will restore any broken relationship that may exist between any child and dad that are standing, and that you will rebuild and bring back together those broken relationships. Father, I pray for every dad, no matter the age, that, that we'll, we will all realize it's never too late to start, it's never too early to start, that we'll, we will be that ever-abiding influence for Jesus in the life of our children. Make these men unashamed lovers of Jesus. Help them to love Him and, and have an overwhelming passion for Christ and that their kids will see it and they'll be unashamed. Give these men wisdom, give them courage, give them patience and endurance. Guard their hearts and minds from the immoral, obsessions, idolatry. God, place a guard around them. And I pray that their families will be forever changed by decisions and choices they've made today in pursuing after these things. I pray for their children that you'll bring those back that have strayed, strengthen those who are walking with you. May they fall in love with the same Jesus that we love. Bless their wives as they have been so faithful in supporting them as dads, being there to encourage. And Lord, I pray you'll bless them. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here among us this morning that would not be able to say, I am a man or woman of God because they've never yielded their life to Jesus, right now, give them the strength and courage to step forward to say, today, today I choose to trust Jesus. Lead them, Lord. As our heads are still bowed, as our dads are still standing, the greatest joy that you can bring to the life of your daddy if you're here without Jesus is to come and trust him as your Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here this morning, adult, child, visitor, longtime member, if you've never yielded your life to Christ right now, we invite you to come in this quiet moment. Just step out from where you're standing or sitting and come and today call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. We're giving you that opportunity. We're not going to sing. We're just giving you a quiet moment here. If you say, Brother Brad, I need to be saved, come. If you need to come and pray as a Christian, come. If you have something you need to renew to Christ, this is the time to come. We, we just, we're not singing. We're not pressuring. We're just giving an opportunity to do what you know the Holy Spirit is saying for you to do. You just do it right now. Nobody's looking around. If you need to come, you come before we close this service. close with the word of prayer. I have a word of prayer. We've got a few things to share with you before we go. I'm going to ask you to, if you're here with your daddy, go stand by him. Take him by the hand. I want you to stand with him right now. Children, just do it at this time. Go stand around where your dad's at. Wives, stand up for your, by your husband for a moment. I'm going to ask you children and spouses to place your hand on him, hold him, hold his hand, place your hand on his shoulder, whatever you need to do, and uh, just to confirm how much you love him. If your dad's in heaven, you just reach your hand out to, to God. <laughs> He'll put his hand on your daddy. He's with the Lord. Let's pray.